You're listening to the preaching podcast from Regency Baptist Church, located in Loomis, California, in the greater Sacramento region. We pray that you'll be blessed by this Bible based message. And it's also our desire that you'll be helped with this message in your personal walk with Jesus and strengthened in your commitment to serve Him daily. We're in Acts chapter number 16 this morning. As you find in your Bibles, I ask you to stand, please, for the reading of God's Word today. Acts chapter number 16. Now, if you remember, and there's a lot of sermons and messages and church times between now and then, but just a month ago, I preached from this passage. I thought, I don't know how many times or really if I've preached from the same passage this close together, really totally different topics. Uh, We were talking about music much in the month of May, Uh, but we're here in Acts 16 again of this powerful story of Paul and Silas in prison and their reaction, how God worked through this great miracle. I'm going to look at a thought today. We are in the very last message of this series entitled Upside Down Christianity. And we've talked about parts of the Bible that as a logical human being, you read and you think, Lord, that doesn't add up. You know, we're taught in school, one plus one equals two. And if you use a formula and if you follow instructions, it's always going to add up. And if it doesn't add up, it's because you didn't use the right formula or you didn't use the right numbers. Can I say that God doesn't work that way? We look at the word of God sometimes through that light and we think, Lord, it doesn't make sense. We talked about what it means when the Bible says that for, uh, uh, to lose your life is gain, but to save your life, that you'll lose it. And all these parts of the Bible where it almost seems like a backward message, but really what it is is this, it's as we learn more about the word of God, we learn more about the mind of Christ. We learn more about the heart of God. And I pray that it's been a, a help to you as we've gone through this. This is uh, sermon number 12. Uh, on this series, and we won't go through all the different lessons. I know that you remember them meticulously, and you could probably recite me to them every point and every illustration, every verse. No, but I do hope that they've been a help. And uh, we're on this last one, and I'm, I'm so moved by this one. Really, this is the foundation of really what brings us together here today. And we're going to look at this story once again, Acts 16, verse 25. The Bible says, And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed, and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Now context, they're in prison at this time. They were preaching Christ. They were opposing false doctrine. They were confronting sin, and the people didn't like that. And so they threw them in prison, and this is how they responded. They prayed, they sang praises to God, and now here's what God did. Verse 26, And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, What must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And as they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house, and he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his straightway. When he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Let's pray. Fathers, we come to you this morning. I pray that you'd speak to us. I pray, Lord, earnestly that if there's anybody here that isn't saved, Father, that today would be the day they get it settled. Father, I thank you for my salvation. Lord, as a little boy, settling that in my heart, crying out to a holy God, undeserving, unworthy, but but given the grace of God. And I pray, Lord, that we'd understand, Lord, what what a treasure that is, but also how obtainable it is for all people. And I pray that every person here would have that settled, and I pray you'd speak to us, Lord, in these next few moments. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. If you've ever been to maybe a memorial service, a funeral, we had one here a couple of weeks ago, or maybe you thought about eternity or you think about heaven, I think it's a good habit for Christians to think about eternity, to think about heaven. But you think about when you see the Lord face to face, For the very first time, 
what you're going to do, what you're going to say, how you're going to respond, and how you're going to react. And then you start to think about eternity. I think we can safe to say that all of us, when we stand before the Lord, will have a sense of speechlessness, if you will, being in awe of the fact that we are in the physical presence of a holy and eternal God. But then you hear people say this, well, when I see God, I'm going to ask him some questions. How, how did that happen with Gideon and the armies of Midian? How, how did that happen, Jonah and the whale? Lord, can you just put on a big projector screen in heaven and let us relive all these stories of the Bible when you look at maybe passages you've read before and you just say, man, I, I just want to know more about that. Maybe there's questions in life that you would just say, man, I wish I could ask God, why is it this way? Or why is it not this way? Maybe some of us will get to the Lord and we'll say, God, I respect and I love and I revere you, but can I just very respectfully ask, what was that all about? <laughs> God, that season of my life, what were you really doing? You know, God doesn't give us all those answers in life, and I think we should be content enough to know that our questions will all be answered in this life. So maybe you've thought about that before. When I see the Lord, I'm going to have these questions, and I'm going to ask God these questions. And I want to talk to you this morning about what I would say in the Bible we see as one of the greatest questions ever asked. We see in verse number 30, this jailer, as Paul and Silas, this earthquake came and the prison doors were open. They were broken out of prison. This man was about ready to take his life. Paul stilled him there for a moment and said, wait a second, just a second. All of us prisoners are here. We have not fled. And he responded to them and asked this question, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Verse 31 is the answer to that question. And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. I want to speak to you on this thought, believing to be saved believing to be saved. We, we have different scenarios like this throughout the word of God. I think about the rich young ruler. He asked Jesus this question, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Nicodemus, how can a man be born when he is old? And Jesus, of course, responded, ye must be born again. Peter preached to the people at Pentecost and they responded, what shall we do? And here the Philippian jailer asked this question, what must I do to be saved. Leading up to this, you see the disciples, the apostles preaching the gospel, and the gospel is spreading like wildfire. But up to this point, even though the gospel has been received, it's also been greatly opposed. And you read through this story, and Acts is filled with stories like this. I've been in Acts uh, recently in my personal Bible reading, and all the opposition, but all the success. Can I say that in the Christian life, that success and if you will, answers to prayer, seeing God work in your life is not going to come without opposition. And you find the apostles facing great opposition as they go forward to serve the Lord. And they're thrown into prison and Paul and Silas there, as far as they know, could be the last moments of their life, decided to sing and to praise the Lord for how good he is and all that he's done. And God saw that and in his sovereignty brought an earthquake and broke them out of prison well, context, Roman law at this time says that if the jailer, on his watch, were to have the prisoners escape, he wouldn't have just been fired. He wouldn't have lost his pension plan. He wouldn't have been reprimanded. He would have been killed. A life for a life. Now, now we don't live by a lot of those kind of rules in our society, so this man knows that if these prisoners are escaped, I'm better, and in his eyes, he says, I'm better to take my own life than to let the rulers and leaders and government do to me. Who knows what they're going to do to me? So this man is about ready to take his own life, and Paul said, well, wait, 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 wait a second, careful now, hold on, we're all still here. We haven't left. We haven't gone anywhere. And this man, and with all of his heart, pleaded and said, what do I need to do? We, we, we call this rock bottom, a low point. Can I say that the way you come to Christ may be different, but coming to Christ 
is the common thread that joins us all together that call ourselves Christians. This man had reached a point of rock bottom in his life. And maybe God did that with you. Maybe that's your story. Maybe you say, Pastor, I could tell you about the time and all that God did to bring me to a point that was so low that I had to humble myself and realize that I needed the Lord and nobody else. And you ask that question, God, what do I need to do to prove my worth? Lord, what do I need to do to be accepted? God, what do I need to do to be saved? Lord, what can I do to earn your trust? And all that God says is this, have faith. Believe. Now, when you consider all that God has done for us, for God to say, to inherit eternal life, to go to heaven, to have all the riches of glory, to stand before the Lord, to have a mansion, to be on the streets that are paved with gold, to have that water that will cause you to never thirst again, never sorrow again, never pay. Lord, how do I get that? And God says, just say yes. Just believe. I've talked to enough people and presented the gospel, and you get this sense of, well, I do have faith, but there has to be something more. There has to be something else that I need to do in order to get saved. And the Bible says through so many passages of Scripture that what is required for salvation, what God asks of us to do to be saved, is simply to believe and to have faith in Him. This is the question that that jailer needed answered. And can I say that this is the question that every single person in this world must ask before they pass on into eternal life in order to be saved. What must I do to be saved? And can I tell you, friend, that the Word of God has the answer of what we need to do to be saved. And the answer is simple. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So many will say, well, it's too simple. There has to be something more. Surely that's not it. Well, what else do I have to do? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Salvation, the word itself, means to salvage something or to prevent something from destruction. And can I just get you to understand this, that God's desire is for every single person that he created. And if you're here today, God created you, and God knows you by name, and Jesus died for you, and he loves you, and he is working in your life for this purpose to draw you closer to him. It's amazing to see how God uses the gospel to spread around the world. I was just talking to somebody recently uh, with one of our missionaries that we support, and for the sake of where they are on a public live stream, even one of our side that's not super big or anything, I wouldn't say this on a public domain, but is in a very closed area in the world. They say they can't even say the word missionary where they are. They'll, they'll just say M. We can't even say the word. We're, we're so fearful that we're going to get thrown out, and, but we know that God's called us here and want to plant a church and, and what God is doing and how God has used an individual to rise in, in areas of education, to be able to speak freely about the gospel in a very formal platform that wouldn't be allowed on the streets. And it's just an amazing miracle. I wish I could walk you through more of it, but just to say this, God is getting the gospel out in the world. The gospel is being spread through missionaries and through churches and through Christians. Why? Because God's desire is this, that all men will come to repentance and be saved. And God wants you to be saved. God wants every person to be saved. And God worked at this time, in this scenario, in this story, and brought this miracle, I believe, for many purposes. And one of them was so that this jailer would come to Christ and be saved. A few thoughts on this. Number one, we see this, a question that reveals a sinner. A question that reveals a sinner. Can I say this? I am not a sinner because I sin. I sin because I'm a sinner. You need to understand this, that sin is a part of who you are. It's a part of your very DNA. The Bible goes so much to say that we are born this way. You know, we're talking a lot of bit in our world about how we're born. I'm born this way. I'm born that way. Well, a big part of that question is that you are born a sinner. And certain things that you feel and certain ways that you react and certain ways that you respond or how you treat people or things that you say or how we lash out, how we do things goes to this common thread that you are born with a sin nature. Now, I've been soul winning enough to know this, that most people think they're pretty good. Nine times out of ten, if I ask that question, do you know for sure if you were to die today that you go to heaven? 
And if somebody responds yes, nine times out of ten, how, how do you know that? I'm a pretty good person. I'm not that bad. I'm not saying that from statistics. I'm saying that from going solding my whole life and hearing from people's mouth. I've only had a couple people say, I've never sinned before. I've never done a single thing wrong. You kind of just look at them like, really? Your kids are right there. I mean, I could ask them. <laughs> it's a part of who we are. The Bible says in Psalm 58, 3, the wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born speaking lies. Psalm 51, David said, in iniquity did my mother conceive me. We are born with a sin nature. We are born with this sin. We, we are dead in this sin. Romans 5, 12 says, wherefore, as by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. God says not only is your sin a, a problem, your sin not only hurts your life, it takes away from your life. Ephesians 2, 1 goes to say, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. You could say this, that sin removes your usefulness. It removes your purpose. It removes your life. Maybe you've heard this term, dead man walking. And that's what sin does to a person. Dead man walking. Dead woman walking. We're born into this sin. We, are, we, we, we face death by this sin. We, we are also condemned by this sin. The Bible says in James 2.10, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Now, most of us would say this, well, well I've, I've done some things wrong, but I haven't done what other people have done. You know what God says? If you've sinned once, you might as well just say that you've done them all. Because if you're a sinner, a sinner's a sinner. There's not these categories of sinners that God says, well, there's these kinds of sinners. And we do find different types of sin and how we find order and how we deal with things and how we work through things in our society. But when you stand before God one day, and the question of eternity is asked, it's not going to come down to, well, I lie, but I didn't cheat. I, I said some bad things, but I didn't actually hurt that person. I, I, I might have done some things, but not quite. It's not going to matter. We are condemned by the fact that we have committed sins. The Bible says the wages of sin, the payment of sin, the condemnation of sin is death. Revelation 20, 14 and 15 tells us, whosoever one day was not found written in the book of life, is cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. I like how Jesus says it in Matthew 5, 29 and 30. He says, if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Well, what is Jesus saying there? Pluck out your eye. Cut off God. God, what are you saying? He's saying this. Whatever you do, don't die without dealing with your sin. Whatever you do, don't die and go to hell. Whatever you do, realize that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. Realize that you need help. There's condemnation from sin. Do not lie to yourself and think anything else than that you are are a sinner who is in need of Jesus Christ. He says, whatever you do, whatever you do, deal with your sin. This question recognizes a sinner. Why would the jailer ask, what must I do? Because he knew, I need to do something. And can I say, no matter how much money you have in the bank or what experience you have or what skills you think you've acquired in this life, you need help because you're a sinner. It's a question that reveals a sinner. It's a question, number two, that recognizes a Savior. Now, if you're saved today, we, we could swap stories. And can I say, I love hearing stories about how people get saved. It's a blessing to hear that maybe for some it was as a child or it was through a, a tragic experience. Maybe it was through somebody working on you day after day, week after week, month after month, maybe for years. Maybe it was through many times in church and you know, we all have these different ways of how God brought us to him. And we all might have a different story of how we came to Jesus for salvation. But if you're saved, the common thread might not be how you came, but who you came to. And this is a question that recognizes the Savior. The Bible says in John 14, 6, 
Jesus saith unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Acts 4.12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. John 4, 13 and 14, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Romans 10, 9 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Jesus said in John 15, 1, I am the true vine. The Bible tells us this, the answer is Christ. There's no other name. There's no other Savior. There's no other right answer. I don't believe in this thought that we all have our different ways to heaven and we'll all get to the same place, kind of like we came to church and some came down the freeway, some came the back roads, and we'll all just get there our different ways. No, there is one way. There is one name. It wasn't just the 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 seeker sense of mentality that threw Paul and Silas in prison, they said, you keep preaching that name. And they said, all we can do is speak the things that we have heard, but we can't stop preaching that name. And that name is Jesus Christ. The Catholics would say, you have to get baptized, pray to Mary, and join the church to get saved. Mormons would say, you have to work towards becoming worthy, and uh, uh, you'll maybe join this small group of a few thousand in heaven. Jehovah's Witnesses would say that you have to do good and maybe you can inherit the earth one day. The Buddhists would say that you need to reach enlightenment after so many reincarnations to inherit some kind of blissful eternal life. The Muslims would say you need to submit to Allah and prove your works to Him. The Hindus would say that you need to accept their millions of gods. The Gnostics would say, it's anyone's guess. The Atheists would say, there's nothing to be afraid of or even get excited about. New Age Christians would say you need to have an awakening or, or do something for the Lord to, to, to earn it or work enough. But I tell you this, the Bible says it's Jesus and Jesus is enough. The Bible says for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. There's not a lot of wiggle room in those verses. What it means is this, Jesus plus nothing. What do you need to do to be saved? The answer is Jesus. We had a joke in school. If you didn't know the answer, just say Jesus, because Jesus is the answer to everything. Amen? And if you're a Christian school kid, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's not church attendance. It's not giving. It's not doing good to others. It's not having a good heart. If you think you're good enough to go to heaven, friend, you are lying and you are deceived. You need Christ. Salvation is a gift to be received. It's not a prize to be earned. It's not by works, it's not by another God, it's by Christ alone. I read a story of a man, he was the first one to tightrope across the Niagara Falls. How many of you just makes you scared just thinking about that? And uh, he, he got so good at it, he made a show about it and started to carry things with him. He cook a, uh, carried a stovetop and carried different things across the tightrope just to show his skill in doing this. But through this feat, he carried his manager across his back on that tightrope across the Niagara Falls. And he looked back to the man and he said, Look up, Harry. You are no longer a coal curd. You are now a blondin, which is their, both of their last names. He said, Until I clear this place, I want you to be a part of me. Mind, body, and soul. If I sway, you sway with me. Do not attempt to do any balancing yourself. If you do, we will both go to our death. He said, you need to be a part of me. Can I say that when you get saved, you get a part of him. The Bible says, but as many as received him, to them gave you power to be called the sons of God. The Bible says that you receive the Holy Spirit. If any man have not the Spirit of God, he is none of him. It's a question that recognizes, that requires a Savior, because it's a Savior that we need, and your good works can't save you. This church can't save you. This pastor who's a sinner can't save you. Your tithing record can't save you. Your Savior is Jesus Christ. It's a question number three that relays a simplicity. A simplicity. I get a little bit weary with this. Sometimes we get doubtful about our salvation because we want it to be this big experience. And I don't want to diminish it because salvation is a big experience. But it's not the same experience for every person. It's not the same emotional experience for every person. 
Well, let me just ask this, and if you're comfortable with sharing, how many shed tears when you got saved? So when I got saved, I remember very vividly shedding tears. How many would say, I didn't shed tears, but I felt something? Now, somebody might look at you and say, well, you didn't get saved because you didn't have that big experience. Can I just say, there's a simplicity to that, and if we're not careful, we can overcomplicate what God made very simple. Powerful, but simple. I can imagine that this man, fearing for his life, was probably very emotional. Ready to take his sword, take his life. I'm done. I fail. There's nothing else that I can do. I imagine a man, no matter how tough you think you are, will be pretty emotional at that state. And then that state said, what do I need to do? Believe. Believe and you'll be saved. Maybe for you, it was that kind of a moment. Maybe for you, it was more like me, where I was in a church service as a young boy, where I I felt conviction, and I felt the Lord speaking to my heart, and I couldn't get away from it. And and that night, settled in my heart, in my mother's bedside, and prayed and accepted Christ and get saved. I don't remember shedding tears. I don't remember a big fanfare at the house that day with, you know, the whole church coming by. But I know in my heart what happened. It relays a simplicity. Romans 10, 9 tells us that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. The Bible says confession plus reception. In other words, you need to convey it. Yes, Lord, I believe in you. Maybe you prayed a prayer, whatever you did. Lord, I I believe in you. I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm in need of you. I know I'd go to hell if I were to pay for my sins. God, I know that I need you. But also to believe, man, I wish I could go around with a postcard to everybody and say, repeat this and you'll be saved. Repeat this and you'll be saved. Repeat this and you'll be saved. And what a great thing that would be if God worked that way. But God says it's confession, but it's also a matter of the heart. That's why I always want to be careful to say they did or they did not get saved. All I can say is what I saw them do. But only God really sees the heart. Can I say that our job as soul winners is not to save, it's to tell the truth. It's to preach the truth. It's to soul warn, if you will. God is the one who does the winning. It it, it wasn't an experience, maybe for every individual in this same way, but it was powerful for every individual, for those that confessed and believed in their heart and have done the same today. Can I say that it's not enough just to believe in Jesus? And let me explain what that means. The Bible says in James 2.19, thou, thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. So it's not enough just to say, because I'll hear this, well, I've always believed in God, and I've always gone to church, Because if I'm not careful, that could be my story too. All I know on Sunday is going to church. It's what I was raised in. It's what I grew up in. It's all that I know that you do on Sunday. And the Bible says that Satan, the devils, they believe in God too. It's kind of like this. If, If we were to invite you over to our house for a meal and we're to put everything on the table and, and get everyone situated and do all that and, and try to gather together and pray and, and say, man, let, let, let's eat together. This is great. It smells good, looks good. And you were to sit in your seat with your hands in your pockets and look at that food and everyone starts eating away and you say, man, Mrs. Becker, you outdid yourself. Man, this is great. This smells awesome. This smells wonderful. Meanwhile, my plate's probably empty at that point and others are still working on theirs and You know, you go through, man, and you didn't pick up your fork one time. I'd probably look over and say, everything okay? This is great. I love it. Man, I love this food. I love barbecue ribs. I love mashed potatoes. I love uh, dinner rolls with with, with butter and honey. And we got to be careful, amen. We're not quite done yet. Man, I love this stuff. I like it. I, I, I so much, I believe that it's here. I believe that it's good. I believe that it's real. Can I say this? But until you pick up the fork, you haven't quite received it yet. It's not enough just to say I've always believed in God. Can I just ask this? Is there a moment in time that you can go back to where you say, I received him as my personal savior? It was at that moment that I bowed my head and I was sure of my salvation. I made confession that, Lord, I understand now what it means to be saved. 
And God, I put my faith and trust in you. And today, I've believed in you all this time. But today, I get it settled and receive you as my personal Savior. It's not just enough to believe. You have to receive Him, confess with your mouth, believe in your heart. I also believe this, the simplicity of it is this, that it's also a one-time decision. It's not a process of events that take place, and then eventually you're saved. We have a discipleship class here at the church that's about 10 weeks, and it's a little bit of a go at your own pace. But you don't have to go through a discipleship class in order to get saved. You might have a job that you're a part of, and you had to go through a, a period of training before you could work that job. Can I say, the Christian life doesn't work that way. That when you receive the Lord, it's a one and done deal. The Bible uses that term, being born again. Ye must be born again. If I were to ask you of your birth date and your birth place, and maybe you know the events of your birth, there would be a date, there would be a time, there would be a memory, there would be a testimony of that event that took place. Jesus said this, in order to have eternal life, you must be born again again. I would never want to cause somebody to doubt their salvation that is saved, but I do want to ask that question, is there some time that you can look back to to say, that was the day, that was the moment? Now, I've always believed, because we've established that, that it's not enough just to believe. It's not just, well, I've always done the church thing, because it's not also by works. When was the moment that you were born again? Again, we need to bring simplicity to what God made very clear and not complicate, not to confuse, not to corrupt what God made very clear in Scripture. I like this, number four. Lastly, it's a question that revolutionizes a story. We see a man changed. We see a family changed. We see a house changed. A part of that change started with the fact that he got saved. And that's the greatest change that happened in his life. But not only that, his family heard the gospel, and they got saved. Can I just say this, that when somebody gets saved, that the gospel has a, has a ripple effect to it. And you never know who will get saved by your testimony. You will never know who gets saved if dad got saved, or mom got saved, or a kid got saved. And you could probably think about in your family how it worked for you. I know on my wife's side and also on our side, we, we have stories of how God led our maybe grandparents and parents and loved ones to the Lord. And, and the gospel kind of works like wildfire sometimes through those scenarios. It's a powerful, it's an amazing thing. And I think of a little boy and a little girl and a family one day that say, that was the day that our home changed. That was the day that our family changed. That was the day that our direction changed. That was the day that our uh, the definition of what is fun change. That's the day that everything in our family's name changed when dad got saved. His family heard the gospel and they got saved. They also followed the Lord and got baptized. We find baptism is more of a reaction of salvation in scripture. It's not a let's wait and think about it and well, we'll see if I got my life together. Can I just encourage you with this, that the people we see get saved in the Bible were brand new Christians. I've heard this so much, pastor, before I get baptized, i got to get some things figured out. Well, why? Because God doesn't require that in Scripture in order to be baptized. Saved and then baptized. That was the reaction from salvation with this family. Verse 33, and took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized. Can I say, he didn't even give them a time to recover. They were beaten. They were hurting. They had been through it. They they were on a mountaintop. And I imagine emotions came down and Paul and Silas probably thought, whew, we're tired. We've been up till midnight singing and praising the Lord and it was great. And then the earthquake came. Emmanuel adrenaline starts going. And then we about busted out and thought, well, let's stay here for just a minute. This man gets saved and we're praying with him and praising God with him. And then his family gets saved. and They go back. Maybe it's the early part of the day. Maybe it's long into the next day. I don't know what point, but I can imagine that they are tired. But he didn't wait to get baptized. He said, I, I want to make it clear that I'm a Christian now. I'm born again. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Not only that, he was revolutionized in that he, he started to serve. The first thing he did was he said, hey, I want you to come to my home. And what does the Bible say that he did? He washed their stripes. He helped them. 
When you think about all that God has done for you, Christian, the response should be this. Lord, what can I now do for you? Who can I help? Who, who can I give the gospel to? Who can I preach to? Where, where can I serve? Where can I get involved? What can I do? He served as a response to his faith. Can I tell you, Christians, you don't need a position to serve. You just need a burden. You don't need a position. Salvation is qualification enough to preach the gospel and pray for people and help people and get busy in the work of the Lord today. I want to ask you today, do you need to be saved? Maybe you're sitting here and you say, you know what, I've maybe overcomplicated it or I've put it off. I've, I've weighed the balances too much and I've missed the point of just the fact that I need Christ and I'm a sinner and I'm condemned without him. And all I need to do today is get it settled and confess and believe and receive Christ as my personal Savior and get it settled and make today my story. Make today my testimony. Make today the day that I can go back to and say it was on June the 30th, 2024. That was the day. Pastor Becker preached that message. No idea what he said, but I know what God did in my heart, and that's the day that I got saved. Maybe today God's speaking to your heart, and that decision needs to be made for you today. Maybe it's the next steps of this man. Hey, let, let's do this. Let, baptism right away. I want everybody to know a Roman soldier. Can we just in a moment put into context the pressure of making that public? He didn't go into a formal church service and let's do this behind curtains and closed doors. This was in a, a public place. Put a target on his back. I want the world to know what happened to me. Is it the next steps in your life? Maybe you've been saved, but you say, you know what, I've been so consumed with me that I haven't put myself in a position to serve. Father in heaven, as we close today, I thank you, Lord. God, that you give us the answer to the greatest question of all. What does man need to do? What do we need to do in order to be saved? Father, I thank you for salvation. I thank you for eternity. I thank you for the grace of God that was shown to us on Calvary by your blood, by your stripes, by your, by your suffering. And as the Bible says, it's by your stripes that we are healed. Father, I pray that anybody sitting here would realize that we have been given something so great, so far above what we could ever earn in, in a thousand lifetimes. And it's offered freely. Father, if there's somebody here that isn't saved, I pray today they would put aside any excuse, distraction, any, any, any logic that would keep them from getting that settled in their heart today. Father, help us, I pray. Thank you for listening to the preaching podcast from Regency Baptist Church. We pray that God has used this message to stir your heart for the gospel's sake. To get information about our ministry or to get in contact with us, please visit us at regencybaptistchurch.org. If you were encouraged by this Bible message, share it with a friend, contact us, or tune in next time to the Regency Baptist Church Preaching Podcast.